Several years ago, I became familiar with this name, Dave Rubin. Rubin, Rubin. What is, what is Dave Rubin doing? I keep hearing a buzz about him. And uh, this is when you started your Locals format. And I said, okay, what is Locals? Oh, it's this great free speech platform that this comedian named Dave Rubin has founded. I think I want to join this. So I signed up. I paid my little bit of money. And I loved the, the platform. And as someone who was really concerned about the censorship that was happening in various parts of the media, on YouTube, hearing about people being shadow banned, etc., I really appreciated what Dave was doing in creating a platform for free speech. And then, the next thing you know, Dave actually responded to one of the messages that I sent him to say, Dave, I'd love for you to come to Budapest. And I'm just this disembodied you know, person sending him a message, and he was very kind enough to respond and refer me to his, his uh, PA at that time, who now is... I think in Nashville, and uh, she was kind enough to work with me, and we got Dave to participate in our Canceling Cancel Culture program that was held during the height of the COVID, and unfortunately, we were still in lockdown, so many of the presenters, like Dave, participated via Zoom, and this was like the greatest thing ever, and he was so kind to do this, and then, you know, it's like, what is Dave doing now? Well... This thing called Rumble was out there, and it had been out there, but Rumble wanted to get bigger, and Rumble wanted to take on YouTube, and they approached Dave, and they wanted to do a deal with Dave. So now Locals is a part of Rumble, and to show you what a true in it, in it for the fight Dave is, he didn't just cash out and take his money from Rumble. He exchanged his stock for a share in Rumble. They got that right? Good. And so he is in it. He's, he is really just this great, wonderful person who has taken on this issue of censorship and, um, and take it on in a really personal way. And I just think it's the most fascinating story that here is this comedian who is doing more than any politician that I know of to help protect free speech, which is the First Amendment in the U.S., as we know. And so without further ado, may I please introduce Dave Rubin. Thank you. Thank you, guys, and thank you for the kind words. Uh, now that you're all familiar with my stock portfolio, <laughs> we can begin. I don't give any stock tips. Uh, I hope you don't mind the handheld mic instead of the podium. I, people always want me to run for something, and I feel like if I get to a podium, this will not end well. So we're going to do the handheld mic. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm quite moved. You know, uh, we're just coming back uh, from nine days in Israel. We flew in this morning, and uh, so I'm, I'm quite accustomed after six days in Jerusalem to all of this stone, which really, uh, it's history. It's history. And when we were putting this trip together and we, we got the call uh, to come to Budapest, come to Hungary, and, and do some things in Israel, we thought there really is something that we can, we can try to find that we're all searching for right now. And I, and I think some good things are happening in Israel. There's clearly some good things happening in Hungary. There's some good things happening in America. But we're, we're missing something that I think is beginning to be uh, kind of unfurled here, and, and maybe in Israel as well, uh, that I wanted to talk about today. Before uh, I get into any of that, I want to promise you guys that this will be a, uh, a, a one-of-a-kind speech, because I, I try, as you know, as many of you probably know, uh, I toured with Jordan Peterson for about a year and a half uh, to 2018 and 2019, about 120 shows, 20 countries, uh, and he never gave the same lecture twice. So I, I always try to do that. Jordan Peterson will actually be here in Budapest tomorrow night. I'm sure some of you are going to be there. And uh, and I think the ideas that Jordan has uh, put forth in the world are, are the things that are going to correct so much of what is wrong with all of our cultural institutions, our political institutions, our technological institutions, and all of those things. So, 
Uh, first, I thought I would just tell you a little bit about my, my political adventure for some of you that maybe not, are not so familiar with me. And it's funny because I, I just sat down with a bunch of Hungarian media for about an hour beforehand, and I was trying to figure out, well, what, what am I going to talk about tonight? Sort of where, where, where am I at mentally? And having come off this trip, especially being in Israel where... You know, it's interesting. They're they're doing they're doing history and future. They're trying to balance these two things, and I think that really is what almost all Western societies are trying to do right now. It was very clear. I hadn't been to to Israel in about seven years. They're building up very fast, meaning the country's just going up. Roads and buildings and skyscrapers everywhere. New cities, absolutely remarkable. They're making they're making the desert bloom. It's green everywhere. It's just incredible in a place with very few natural resources. But they're also digging down. They're excavating and they're uncovering the history of of their people and really of Western civilization. And that was sort of what our thesis was when we were trying to figure out how we were going to do this trip. What are what are we looking for in Israel and Hungary? As I said, that that is happening. Uh, that, that is right. That is right, because there is so much uh, that is not right. So before I get to all of that, a little bit on my, on my personal history, uh, because you know we throw around these words, classical, liberal, conservative, all of these terms, and, and people sort of don't know what these things any, mean anymore. We, I think we're going through a massive reshift uh, of, of virtually everything politically. There's new alliances to be had. Uh, you know, we're 20 some odd years into social media and all the algorithmic tricks that are silencing us and shadow banning us and boosting some people and de-boosting other people and all of these things. And we're trying to figure out how do we, how do we kind of get through this? So very briefly, uh, in terms of my own, my own sort of political evolution, I was a lefty most of my life. I was, uh, I grew up in New York, Democrat family. We were, we were liberals. Now liberalism, of course, at least from an American perspective, wasn't always what liberalism is now. There, there were sort of, there was a moderate force within liberalism. Uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. was a liberal. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Uh, that was an idea that was a Democrat principle. He was for, he was anti-war. He was low tax. Uh, he wanted to reduce taxes. Uh, these were Democrat principles, and that was sort of the, the Democrat tradition that I kind of grew up in. And then, of course, in the last 15 years or so, probably more so in the last 10 years, decade or so, uh, something happened to the liberals. The liberals sort of all went crazy left. They all became this thing that we now call progressive, which in essence, as I'm here in Eastern Europe, is far more in common with communism or socialism or any of the other horrific collectivist movements of the past uh, than anything that had to do with any sort of American value or anything related to freedom or individual uh, liberty or anything like that. But it really caught on, and it caught on in a really crazy way, and I think it, it basically sideswiped everybody, uh, where suddenly all of our cultural institutions, our political institutions, our mainstream media, big tech, everything sort of started pushing this crazy, what we all now refer to as wokeism, it started pushing this on us, that your identity, if you happen to be born white, or you're born black, or you're gay, or you're Chinese, or whatever it is, your immutable characteristics somehow are more important than the individual that's inside you. And we all know, or I shouldn't say we all know, any, any somewhat evolved person knows that this is simply not the truth. I could look around this room, and if you think that I could attain anything by looking at any one of you and thinking, well, there's someone, he's a guy, he's middle-aged, he's white, he must think this. I mean, that really is the essence of prejudice, right? What is, what is prejudice? Prejudice is to prejudge. And yet we've somehow done something now where our entire... Our entire sort of running ethos, and from an American perspective, is based on the things that are completely counter to individual liberty, which is what the country was set up on. And this sort of just rampaged through absolutely everything, and it led to a situation where a guy like me who was a lefty, I started waking up to some of this stuff and saying, hey, you know, something, something's not right here, guys, what's going on? All I started to do, and this was sort of the, the moment, all I started to do was talk to some people on the right. And I talked to guys that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, like Larry Elder and Ben Shapiro and Dennis Prager and Glenn Beck. 
And what I found was I had some political disagreements with them, but I found them to be thoughtful and they knew what they thought and why they thought it. Uh, but more than anything, I found them to be sort of generous of spirit. There was, there was a kindness there and, a, and an ability to agree to disagree. And that, I thought, was a liberal tradition. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it no longer is. So right now in America, we have this really wild balance. Uh, well, we had a balance, and now we have a disbalance. We have an unbalance, I would say, which is that one party has gone completely off the deep end, and that's scaring an awful lot of people. And clearly, America, which is the, it's the leader of the world for a lot of good reasons, right? We created this country in 250 years. We brought more peace and uh, and acceptance and decency and opportunity and the pursuit of happiness to more people in the world than could have ever been imagined. It is the greatest human experiment ever. And yet we right now have a movement in America that is completely counter to that. And it is fueled by big tech. It is fueled by the Democrat party and the media establishment and all of those things. And now it seems to be being exported, right? It seems to be being exported so that I'm here in Hungary talking about this because you have a version of this. And I was in Israel yesterday talking about this because they have a version of this. And the question is, well, how did it, how did it burst forth? How did this happen so that suddenly we are now questioning things that we know we don't have to question anymore? Uh, my friend Douglas Murray, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the great conservative author, you know, he constantly talks about how we had all of these problems solved. Basic problems were solved. And now we've decided to unearth all of these things. That basically, now the barbarians are at the gate and we're debating what gender pronouns they are. This is a problem, right? This is a real problem. Instead of dealing with the issues head on, we're suddenly wondering, are there biological differences between boys and girls? And should this uh, be discussed privately with, with teachers and students hiding that from parents? I mean, these, these are crazy issues. We all know they're crazy. And I think one of the reasons we, we sort of lose constantly, I always say on the show, we're, we're just constantly sucked to this slow descent to hell with these people is because those of you that are here that are broadly conservative, and, and my first book was a full defense of classical liberalism, and it's kind of funny, I can't, it's hard for me to, from an American perspective to, to say that I'm a liberal anymore, uh, and it probably is for some of you guys as well, because the word liberal has been so hijacked and we could do a whole different talk on that. But for anyone here that's broadly conservative right now, and what I mean by that is you basically believe in reality, you believe in biology, uh, you want limited government, you believe that you have some autonomy over your life. The reason we keep losing, the reason we keep being sucked into that, that seemingly bottomless pit is because we have jobs, we have families, we have other things to do, and the other guys don't. They really don't. They've put everything into, you've met some of the protesters, they don't have jobs. They don't have good hairstylists either, and they could, <laughs> wouldn't kill them to hit the gym. But, but there really is something to that. There is a set of people right now in all of these Western countries that are, that are hell-bent on, on demolishing the goodness of the West. And we have to figure out a way around it. And it has hit everything. Uh, as some of you guys know, I, I lived in California for the last eight years. And a year and a half ago, post-COVID and, and post-lockdowns and mandates and injections and riots and all of the craziness, crime and defunding the police and everything else, I couldn't take it anymore. And I moved to the free state of Florida. And I, I talk about Florida a lot on the show uh, because one of the things that's happening in Florida, I think, is something that probably that seems to be happening here, where I think Hungary seems to be sort of blueprinting for Europe how how other European nations can go ahead and exist and defend your borders, defend your culture as you see fit. It's your right to do that. It's not another nation's right to do that. You guys as Hungarians will figure out how to go forward and how to live freely and all of those things. But that's very counter, obviously, to a, to a much bigger globalist operation, right? And in America, we beautifully have a federalist system. We have this idea that you can bounce around from state to state. If you don't like it in America, you're not happy in Cali? Well, you don't have to leave America. You don't have to go to California or you don't have to go to uh, Mexico or Canada, right? You can actually just 
go across this country. You can go to Florida and live almost a completely different life. And I can tell you, having lived in California with the crime and the drugs and all of the stuff, I moved to Florida where there's low taxes, there's low regulation, there's a respect for individual rights and autonomy. Uh, we're removing the woke stuff out of the schools. Uh, all, of, all of the things that I sense that you guys really want here and which were most of the questions that I got from the Hungarian media before uh, joining you tonight, um, it's happening in America. And now what's happening is Florida is now blueprinting that and sending it across the nation. So school choice, for example, instead of just funding systems that are endlessly failing, we're now funding students in Florida. And then you can take that credit and you can go to a public school or a private school or a charter school or homeschool, whatever it might be. But you as the parent have some autonomy in that so that your children will not be brainwashed. That's now happening in Iowa. It's happening in South Dakota and a bunch of other states. And it's not just on the woke stuff. We're getting ESG out of our governmental institutions. We're doing all of the things right. We're funding the police. When we get illegals that are brought into Florida, we, we, send, well, we send them to Martha's Vineyard and then we very, quickly, we very quickly find out how tolerant the liberals are. Do you guys know that Barack Obama has a 30-acre estate on the water in Martha's Vineyard, on the water, which makes you wonder if he believes any of this climate change nonsense. That's one thing, right? Uh, but 30 acres. There were about 30 illegals that Ron DeSantis sent to Martha's Vineyard. Obama could have given each of them an acre right? Each of them an acre, and instead they got rid of them, what, like in 24 hours. It was really, it was really just remarkable, which is consistent with what we see out of almost everything with, with the left these days. They have very easy solutions to very complex problems, and usually if you just pull that really thin veneer back, there's not much there. There's a lot of outrage, there's a lot of hysteria, there's a lot of anger, uh, but there aren't really good ideas. And that's why so much is so broken in America right now. And it's, again, why I wanted to do this trip, because I wanted to see what was right in Israel, what's going right in Hungary, so that I can help bring it back to America, because we actually need help right now. I mean, that's becoming very obvious to me. You know, our, our, the multicultural nature of America which again is, is remarkably incredible. The idea that people from all walks of life, from every corner on earth, could come to the same place and because they believe that they have some purpose, the pursuit of happiness, that they could pursue happiness, that they could build a great nation is really incredible. But 250 years into this thing, we're, we're lost. We really are. Now we have pockets where it's working. Obviously Florida is one of them. But as a nation, we are somewhat lost. And what I was finding in Israel is that there, there still seems to be a purpose there. You know, they just celebrated their 75th anniversary and there seemed to be a real purpose. The people did not forget why they created the nation in the first place. They have all sorts of external problems. They have internal problems with this judicial reform bill. Uh, but when you walk around there, you walk around Jerusalem and you see people, first off, the people of every color and creed and all of those things, all, all of the diversity that really doesn't matter that much because, of course, intellectual diversity is what actually matters. Uh, but you see all of these people, they're still trying to build something. And something has happened in America where we don't know what we're trying to build anymore. And that's why it feels like it's crumbling I would say fairly quickly, and unfortunately now, because of, because of tech and because of, of a media that, that is exacerbating the situation, uh, the question is, will we be the world leader? And I suspect if I polled all of you guys right now, you probably still do want America to be the world leader to some extent. But right now, and I say this as an American, this is on foreign soil, which is a hard thing to say, I don't know that you should trust us that much right now, right? Like, I don't know that we're doing it correctly enough, with enough moral authority, uh, a mu a, enough uh, fortitude to really lead the world right now. And if we don't do it, it's going to be much worse. I think most people recognize that. So having talked about Florida a little bit, uh, when I sat down with the, uh, with the journalists before, before coming up here, uh, everybody was asking me about this, this Trump DeSantis thing. So I want to just address that quickly. I want to try to bump, bump around to a couple of things because uh, I've only got about 30 or 40 minutes here. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, Trump was an excellent president from, from my position. I, I didn't vote for him the first time around. I did vote for him the second time around. I've interviewed him. I'm friends with his children. You know, they all live in Florida. His whole family lives in Florida. I think our economy was great. The world was sort of lined up correctly. Things were really working. 
under Trump. And had COVID not happened, uh, I think we'd be in a very different situation right now. I think we'd be in a, a successful second term for him. The left would still be going nuts. We'd still have riots and all those things. But the sort of general focus of the country would be right. America would be leading again. We would be doing things properly. O almost if you basically took virtually everything that we're doing now and you just reversed it, we, that's where we'd be and things would be better. Um, so everyone keeps asking, well, well, Dave, you know, where do you stand on this Trump DeSantis thing? Because that's really where this thing seems to be heading. And as much as I uh, supported Trump the first time around, I sense we really need a shift right now. Like we need, we need a shock to the system. The way, that, the way that Trump was a shock to the system the first time around and no one thought it could happen and all of the excitement of Twitter and the trolling and all those things, it really was, it was the thing that nobody thought could happen and it did happen. I'm sensing we need that again, but a slightly different version of it. What, I, what I'm sensing right now is that we need a shock to the system of competency. We need a shock to the system of someone getting up there and doing exactly what they say they're gonna do and doing it right and lining up an agenda and basically like dominoes, knocking those things down. And that really is what Ron DeSantis is doing in Florida. And I think people all over the world, I mean, I'm getting emails literally every day from Hungary and plenty of other countries, from Japan. People are like, can, can this really happen? Can we actually figure out a way to have a competent, clear leader and so that we can get back to those simple founding documents and we can have a country that is sane again and not have to do this mass migration that we're doing across the United States. Because on one hand, it really is nice. As I said, federalism is really great. You can pick up and go, right? If you guys aren't happy here in Budapest, you can move, I, you can move to the suburbs and it'll perhaps be a little more conservative or something like that. Uh, but you really would have to leave the country if it really started changing. We don't have to do that, and, and that's, that's a beautiful thing if we, can, if we can fix the federal system. And I think there is a chance to do it. And I also think, and I can sort of read it when I, when I talk to people about it, wouldn't it be nice if things just kind of got normal again, you know? W wouldn't it be? Like, wouldn't that be something? You can applaud normalcy, yeah. People don't even remember what normalcy is, right? I mean, these last couple of years, between COVID, between all of the big tech censorship, between the media lying to us about everything, and I think you guys have a version of that as well, you know, the, the media has lied about every big story, everything. If you just took everything the media did and you reversed all of it, if you, read, if you picked up the New York Times, we were at the airport, uh, not, we were at the hotel this morning here in Hungary and I saw the New York Times and it's very rare that I see a print newspaper anymore. And I looked at the headlines and I was like, man, this is just propaganda. But CNN is doing it and the New York Times are doing it and the Washington Post is doing it. And then when you look at big tech, where big tech is then censoring stories for them, right? The Hunter Biden laptop, which we now know it was all true and a whole bunch of us thought it. Or we, a whole bunch of us thought that the Russia collusion thing with Trump was a lie but we couldn't really say it because they'd shadow ban you or, or delete you altogether. Or a whole bunch of us thought that it might be a Wuhan lab leak or that mandates were coming as they were telling us they weren't coming. All of these things, they lied about every single big story. So I think what we're, what we're all kind of struggling with right now, and again, this is why I wanted to take this trip to figure out what it is we can take from the old world, because there were good things in the old world, great thinkers of the old world, incredible people who built unbelievable cities. I mean, what an unbelievable city you have here, absolutely gorgeous, that you guys are now rebuilding, right? I mean, it's incredible. We have to take some things from the old world and we have to bring them into the new world. We have to figure out what is this new world gonna be? And I think linking that to the sort of political situation, we need a leader at this point, and I don't think all the answers are political. I really don't. I think that, you know, as, as Andrew Breitbart said, uh, politics is downstream from culture. So you have to fix the culture first, and then maybe you can fix the politics. You can't just magically find someone who politically is gonna do it right, and then just fix all of your problems. That's not really the way it works. If you can fix a few things, I think, for, I think in almost every situation, it's, it's a bottom-up approach. If you can fix a few things in your life first, whatever that means, to, to link it back to Jordan Peterson, if you can stand up straight with your shoulders back, if you can clean your room, do a few things in your own life, right? And conservatives are pretty good at this sort of thing, right? Conservatives generally have jobs and wear clothes that fit. It's sort of a thing. 
if you can do a little bit of that, and then you can start fixing some of the culture because when they come to you and they say, actually, we're going to teach your seven-year-old in second grade who's a boy that they're actually a girl, and you actually have the fortitude to say, no, you're not, or I'm going to remove my student from this school, or you're going to fight it by showing up to a, a, a board meeting or whatever it might be, then you can start resetting things. Uh, one of the videos that I did for PragerU, and I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with PragerU, I think the third video I did, it was called The Bravery Deficit, because we seem to just be afraid of everything all the time. We're afraid if we say anything that's out of line, anything that's politically incorrect, we're gonna be canceled, we're afraid we're gonna lose our job, we're afraid an anonymous, amorphous Twitter mob is gonna come and say mean things to us, and it's kind of all true, right? Like, it's not just, that's not made up. You might, and I have no doubt, if I polled every single one of you, everyone in this room, and per perhaps myself included, we're not always saying everything we know to be true, right? Because there are consequences for that. But the more we do that, we just acquiesce, we just give grounds for the people who would gladly control us and silence us uh, to do that. And we've given them an awful lot of air. And I think what's happening now, uh, finally, is enough people are just like, no, no more of this nonsense. We cannot do this anymore. We, do, we don't want to repeat the same mistakes that led to you guys now having to rebuild buildings from World War II, right? We don't want to end up in that place, and yet we seem very close to it. So I've tried, uh, in terms of interviewing people, I've tried to interview people from across the political spectrum to kind of come up with the right answers on this stuff. It's interesting because uh, we were in DC, Washington DC, uh, about a month ago. We took three days in DC and we emailed everybody. Everybody in town. Congress was in session, they were just coming back. So we knew that every, every politician was gonna be there. So we emailed about 18 Republicans, and literally everybody said yes, uh, except then Mitch McConnell actually, uh, he fell, so he couldn't do it. And then in a bizarre twist, uh, uh, Rand Paul, the senator from Kentucky, Libertarian Center, one of his staffers was stabbed because it's DC, so then he couldn't come, which was sort of, sort of fitting to the overall situation in DC. Uh, and then Marsha Blackburn, who's a senator from, uh, from Tennessee, she couldn't come because there was a shooting back home. I, I only mention this because it shows you just all the, all the weirdness that is happening in America right now. But the point is, we got 16 Republicans. I didn't tell them any of the questions beforehand, interviewed them, went great. We asked about 20 Democrats. You know how many Democrats we got? None. Zero. And that's not the white power sign, that's a zero. <laughs> we got zero. Uh, not only do we get zero, the only one, we got one response, it was Rashida Tlaib, who I probably think is the worst of the worst. She, at least her office responded, no, everybody else just ignored us. Uh, but I mention that because the only way we're gonna get through any of this, the only way we're going to figure out how to rebuild the institutions, how to get better politicians, how to communicate these ideas better, how to build new tech so that we're not silenced into oblivion and all of these things, we gotta figure out a way to, to rescue the sane people on the other side. And they are there, guys. I, I have no doubt that within your own families, we all have this right now, it's getting harder and harder to talk about politics, right? And it's partly because politics has become religion, especially for the left. Politics has become the most sort of all-encompassing thing that dictates their daily life. And then you wonder why, why they're so hysterical all the time, because they wake up every morning and there's another outrage, there's another cause, there's something else. They now want to believe the science, they want to believe in COVID, the same people, the same people who, you know, five years ago, were telling us all, you know, my body, my choice, right? That's what they were saying, my body, my choice when it came to abortion and women's rights and reproductive health and that sort of thing. Uh, they were the most hysterical when it came to forcing you to inject things in your body. And part of the reason that they won't talk right now, and I wonder, and maybe we can find this out in the panel, I wonder if, for you guys if it's as bad here as it is in America, part of the reason they won't talk right now is because the ideas just aren't that great but they own so much of the cultural and political and media landscape that they can keep winning. They can keep winning without having to debate. Uh, so when I was doing these, uh, these interviews beforehand, just an hour ago or so, uh, all, all of the interviewers asked me the same thing. Why is it that Republicans keep losing, right? Like, if, if we're so sure that 
you know, we're basically, we've got the right ideas and, you know, it's, it's fairly obvious probably to everyone in this room that, you know, we have a better sense of what humans want and what allows for human freedom. Well, why do Republicans keep losing? I mean, why don't more people wake up? And I think there's, there's pl plenty of reasons for that. A lot of it's sort of insider baseball politics. Um, but, but part of it, I think, is a massive branding problem. And it's a branding problem that led us to losing all the institutions in the first place. You guys have families that you care about. You have jobs that you care about. It's not your cause to be out there trying to change the world. You're trying to change it in kind of a marginal way in your own life. And that's really the way it's supposed to be. But they, they went all the way to the end. They went to the end and they said, we will, we will basically try to own the world. And that's what we have to fight against. And we're watching this all over the world right now. So on the, on the tech front, you know, what's been so good, like we get these little moments, guys, right? We get these little moments where we get some goodness. Uh, one of the major good points in the last year is that Elon Musk bought Twitter. And we found out that a bunch of the stuff that we kind of thought was true, were we being shadow banned? Were we being silenced? Was the government, was the United States government, which is supposed to abide by the First Amendment. The government cannot stifle your free speech. The government was working with a giant corporation to silence people. And again, whether that's the Hunter Biden laptop, whether that's the, the COVID mandates, et cetera. But this stuff was happening. Now, it's kind of funny in some regards. It's like we then have these hearings on these things and nobody ever gets fired. Nobody pays the price and the machine just kind of keeps moving. And I think we have to recognize that you can sort of get little wins here and there. I heard Tucker Carlson say that once. You can get little wins here and there, but you probably can't move the entire machine. So we can expose stuff and we can wake people up, but you're probably not just gonna re-engineer the entire system. You probably aren't. And then in, in a case of uh, Tucker Carlson, and a few of you have asked me about Tucker today, uh, you know, sometimes you can scare the machine enough that you're out of a job, which is, uh, I suppose, a little scary, but I think there's some ways that he can get back in the game that'll be uh, quite effective. I think Rumble might be one, one option for him. But we, so we're fighting everything, right? We're fighting a media that lies to us. We're fighting tech that is operating against us. We're fighting political people that, that want to be more political than us, right? Like, I just know it. I just know you guys don't wake up every day. Even all of you that are here because you care about politics, you don't wake up really like thinking about politics as the first most important thing. And you shouldn't. And you shouldn't. So, I'm trying to figure out how we, can, how we can balance all of these things, how we can get back to some of these good conversations. I think we can do it. Uh, I think that, as I said, I think DeSantis really is the guy that can get us out of the mess. Imagine if we all just woke up and we had good leaders again, right? If we just had good leaders again. I think we, could, we can fix this in probably about two years. I really do. So that's what I'm here in Hungary for. And that's what I'm looking forward to chatting with everyone up at this panel about. And uh, I think that was roughly my time for this portion. And we'll, we'll sit and chat with everybody. What do you think about, about all of this stuff? All right. First of all, many thanks indeed, uh, Dave, for that. It was, uh, I agreed with almost all of it. So it's hard for me to know what question <laughs> to ask. Normally, I'm fueled by disagreement. But... I would say that since you have been here, not, not as long as obviously you will stay in total, but since you have been here a few days, what are the two or three things that you've noticed about Hungary, and not just Hungary, but other parts of Europe too, which you think the Americans should really take seriously as importing those ideas? Yeah, so actually I've only been in Hungary for, for just a few hours. We actually got in late this morning. Uh, but I can tell you, having chatted with uh, well, a couple of you guys and having chatted uh, with some of the, of the members of the media, it seems fairly obvious to me that you guys are addressing the actual issues that are the problem, which is why almost everyone that I chatted with the media asked me about the same sort of five or six things that I tried to dive into, albeit somewhat briefly up here. Um, you know, I think, I think fighting this woke thing, really, the, something about the trans thing, which I, I didn't really talk about that much, um, there's something about this thing now, really going for the children, that seems intentionally designed. You know, my own personal belief is that if you as an adult wish to live however you want, you want to 
dress like a woman and you're a man, you want to dress like a man and you're a woman, you want to be in this or that relationship, you know, once you're an adult, you can do whatever you want. That, that's my own personal belief. I know that's not everybody's belief. Um, and I tend to come more on a libertarian perspective on that. Um, but when they go for the children, and that really is one of the things that put DeSantis on the map. You know, this, we know this was happening, uh, and it sounds like it's happening in some of your schools as well. There were teachers that were literally talking to children about sexuality and gender identity that were doing this privately without the parents' uh, knowledge, and they were doing it for months on end, often referring to a child by a, a different name and all of these things. And that, it's so... It's so incredibly outrageous, it's hard for people to really comprehend how twisted it is. And it was school policy, too. And, and it was school policy, and, and not only was it school policy, but it was, the, it was the secrecy that was the really twisted part of it. You know what I mean? You, you could potentially have a situation where a kid, I mean, I find it hard to believe that a kid at, say, eight years old would be having these issues, but you could have a, an issue where there's a kid who's a, a young teenager that would be having some of these issues, and there could be some role for the school to play potentially. But the fact that so much of it was done secretly, and really, and, and why I always say that most of these things, you, have to, it's, you need this bottom-up approach. You know, one of the big wins we got politically in America in the last three years or so was that the election in Virginia, which Glenn Youngkin won, he went right in on this. Every politician in America that has fought the culture wars really said, I'm going to fight this. So in this case, he said, I'm going to get the woke stuff out of the schools. He then won and became governor in Virginia, uh, obviously, Ron DeSantis is sort of the main one in, from the Florida perspective, but this is happening now with uh, Christy Nome in South Dakota and, and a couple others as well. Um, when you fight it, people then start getting a little bit braver. And that's really what we need more. But they're going after the children because they're trying, you know, I say it on the show all the time, they're trying to break everybody's brains. And once they break your child's brain and they can bring that into your home and then as I mentioned earlier, you know, now we're, we're fighting about politics all the time, all the time. Actually, that was one, uh, and then I'll move on. Uh, that was one really interesting lesson that I learned from being in Israel for last week. You know, Israelis, they, they fight and argue about everything, right? It's a, it's, a very, it's a very political society because of the security issues and all that. But a few people told me that for the first time ever, it's coming into the home in a way that is, that is now becoming more destructive. And I think that's intentionally designed by whatever's, whatever's really driving the woke, whatever the, this, this globalist monster is, whatever, whatever we want to call that thing, I think it is intentionally designed right now to bring it into the home. And, uh, and until we can get it out of the home, and, until, and that's why they're going after kids, it, it will just keep coming and replicating. I'm just going to say there's a side issue of some importance. Um, the right of parents to control their children's education is specifically protected quite high up in the, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 1948. I think it's something like Article 12. Um, I have, until the last couple of years, I have never heard anyone on the left specifically attack that right, um, even when reminded where it is um, in, enshrined. Um, I haven't until recently heard anyone on the left attack, for example, the right of free speech or the First Amendment. But now, people on the left actually argue this very straightforwardly, clearly, and without um, disguise. Indeed, not only people on the left, because, of course, um, at the moment, there are institutions of the US government engaged in combating disinformation, uh, which are themselves, they are themselves making statements, criticizing um, free speech, and, and to some degree, democracy. That's what I find most remarkable, do you want to comment well, on that? It, well, it's interesting because, uh, you know, in California right now, they are trying to make California a sanctuary state for underage children. So this is children who are under 18 who want to go through gender transition, meaning that if your parents, let's say, you're a 13-year-old boy, now you identify as a girl, they've already crushed most of the, the requirements. You know, it used to be you'd have to have several letters from psychologists, you'd have to be in therapy for a certain amount of years, all of those things. Uh, they've already eliminated most of those requirements, but now if the parent, let's so, so let's say you're in Florida where they have now banned, by the way, it's a past law uh, just through 
through this uh, congressional session that just closed last week. It is a passed law. They are now banning gender reassignment surgery. And by the way, you should never call it gender affirming surgery. That's constantly what they do and we always use their language. And it's a really bad mistake, right? It is not affirming. <laughs> It, 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 I would argue it's probably the least affirming thing that you could do if you were trying to affirm someone's gender uh, to actually chop their genitals off. Uh, but California, California is now actually going out of their way to say we will be a sanctuary state for these children. So it, it really, this is dystopian. I mean, this is 1984 level stuff where they, they want to take your children from you. And once they do that, then they got you, and last thing on this, that's why they were pushing the, the vaccines on children so hard. They knew if you can get people who don't really understand what we're being injected with or why we, why we are being injected in them, but I have to do it because I don't wanna lose my job or whatever it might be. It's one thing if you do it to yourself, right? If you inject yourself or your spouse with this stuff, but once you do it to your children and then you find out it really didn't work and now myocarditis and all of the other issues that are popping up, they've really got you and, and people really need to understand that that's happening. Yes. You know, you so. bring up the, the question of states seizing children. It's not just California. Michigan does it, Minnesota does it, the state of Maine is debating it now. I think Oregon and Washington, either they are going to do it or they've already done it, and the state of Colorado. People in this part of the world who came through communism, they see what's going on. This was how the communists saw the relationship between the state and children. The, the state took, uh, took precedence over parents. And that's one of the reasons I love living here. I've lived here in Hungary for most of the last two years. I expect to spend the rest of my life here. For all the flaws that this country has, it's not paradise. There's no such thing as paradise. At least it feels real. Mm -hmm. It feels like people haven't gone crazy here. I, I, I notice that when American friends come over, I tell them, that's the first thing you need to know about this country. It's normal. Mm -hmm. And the second thing you need to know is everything you've learned about Hungary from the American media is a lie almost everything, and it really is true. And when people spend any time here, they've come to realize, oh yeah, that's, that's it. We brought Tucker Carlson over here summer of 2021, and thank God for him, because he spent a week here broadcasting. He went and, and talked to Hungarians, actual Hungarians, about the lives they, they lead, and he flipped the narrative in America. So I'm so happy that finally now, it's not at the level of the senior Republican leadership, but at the grassroots, I mean, the fact that you're here, to see what's going on here is really important. Well, it's getting there. It's getting there. I mean, first off, without going too far down the, the rabbit hole of, of what happened to Tucker, I mean, you know, Tucker's out of a job at the moment. It might partly be related to that. He was starting to show people there is a model for a society uh, that is good and decent. But when you when you talk about reality, that that also is why I think that the the DeSantis thing really has teeth this time, because as opposed to let's say Trump's first go around, where he got rid of his opponents fairly quickly with with some name calling, I I really fundamentally believe this. People just want something sane. That's all they want. No one, if 10 years ago you would have said any of this gender stuff or the neo-racism stuff or, or that economics would be upside down, that you can just endlessly print money, that there should be no borders, all, all of this, this is all stuff that 10 years ago virtually every Democrat would have said this is absolutely crazy. And yet it is all mainstream right now. So it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's exactly why I wanted to come here, to, to be around... A place, people and a place that are saying, hey, we have borders, we have a nation state, um, we don't want to go the route that Germany has gone, we don't want to go the route that France has gone, and it seems to me that you guys are doing it properly and you have some of the intellectual backing to do it, and now you have the political backing to do it, and I can also tell you that, you know, <laughs> America, we don't talk about Hungary a lot. I mean, I guess Orban is a fascist. That's the main thing That's we know. That's all they say. Uh, That's but, all they yeah. say. But you know what? That was a joke, everybody. Yeah. That was a joke. <laughs> uh, Victor Orban realized 12 yeah. years ago what Ron DeSantis is just starting to realize, that the old liberal model of, of, of politics and society is broken. You know how it was with uh, when we were younger. We were brought up to believe that politics is here, the private sector is here, and everybody stays, it works in their own sphere. We all work together somehow. I went to journalism school, graduated in 89, and we were still taught back then that the thing to do is to try to be fair. That's so over. 
Orban understood that the way power is really used in post-liberal society, when the left has captured all of the private institutions, the only thing left to conservatives is politics, electoral politics, and we can't be afraid to use the power we have to stop them. You know, it's interesting. So I'm sure many of you know about the fight that DeSantis got in with Disney after the, the, again, quote unquote, don't say gay bill, which had nothing to do with being gay and the word gay wasn't even in the title, et cetera. Uh, But suddenly a lot of conservatives, Mike Pence and Chris Christie and uh, now uh, Nikki Haley, a bunch of conservatives came out and said, oh, no, he's wielding government power in a way that it should not be wielded because we're I thought we were the, the party of small government. And it was a real flip on on reality because what DeSantis did with Disney was take away special rights. So if, if you believe in capitalism, you believe that every corporation, every company, every business, every individual should be treated the same under the law and then they, they're going to fail and succeed on their own merit. DeSantis took away special rights. They had special taxation rights. They had special rights to water and an airport and a whole bunch of things that even if you just cared about amusement parks, that we have SeaWorld there and Universal Studios and Gator World, uh, there's a lot of gators in Florida. They didn't have those rights. So all he did was make them equal with all of the the, the competition that they had. And suddenly you had all these conservatives going, oh boy, this is a, this is a real misuse of power, and that goes to exactly what you're saying. We, we're not, if unless you're a complete anarchist, you believe that a government should exist. So, if you believe that a government should exist, what's the one thing it should do? It should be making sure that the playing field is equal for everybody. That's exactly what he did. It sounds like it's what's and going it make, on here. It should make sure that business stays in its lane. When I was a kid growing up, um, business did not involve itself in pushing radical social agendas and uh, being what we call woke capitalists. Now, that changed in the last decade or two, and the only way we have to fight back is through the government, through elected power in the government. Orban gets it, and this is one of the reasons he went against George Soros so strongly, and in our country, uh, Ron DeSantis gets it. In a way, I don't think Donald Trump does, because Donald Trump, for all of his virtues, did not have the focus and, and the policy discipline to actually follow through. Well, I think one issue that Trump has, so, so I agree with your assessment there, and again, I think that's, it, that's also just a function of, in some extent, DeSantis being from Gen X. I'm, I'm 46 years old. I think DeSantis is 45. I think I'm fairly certain he's younger than me, if I'm not mistaken. Someone could Google it to check. But he grew up in a world that was a little bit before the internet, but he grew up and, be, and became a man and became an adult in the world that we live in now. Trump and Biden and Pelosi and the rest of these people, they're, they're defending a world that doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, to really show you a, a good example of that, one, one of my arguments for DeSantis has been that we, we need the mainstream media to die. We, we really do. And you know, DeSantis, one of the things that he's done, right now he's not talking to NBC News anymore. He is refusing as a policy to talk to NBC News. And the reason he's doing it was because there was a series in over a couple of weeks, they were they lied about like 10 different things in a row. The highlight of them being that Andrea Mitchell, who's one of the, the premier correspondents on, on MSNBC, uh, she was interviewing Kamala Harris. And you know we had this other issue, the, the other one besides the don't say gay issue in Florida was that DeSantis was getting woke stuff out of schools when it came to, to race as well. So there was a, a black, an African-American AP studies course that they were pushing on kids in high school that also was going to have woke gender theory involved in black African-American studies. I mean, it's so bananas, you, you can't even make sense of it. But so he banned that that one course, he banned one course, and then Andrea Mitchell is on NBC News interviewing the vice president about it, and she said, the question, I think I can almost get it verbatim, she said to Kamala Harris, what is it that, that Ron DeSantis doesn't want Americans to know about slavery. And it's like, it's such a, an absolutely enormous lie. And DeSantis's team said, no more. We will not play this game. Now, to get to your point on Trump, Trump will still play the game. And that's part of the problem. I've been trying to explain to people that, that Trump, in a way, he is part of the system now. And he's feeding the system. And that's, that's unfortunate in a way. Again, as somebody that I, genuinely, I like him as a man. But he's, he's now part of the system. He's giving it more energy. We need to, I, the only way you beat this beast is to starve this beast. And I think that that's what DeSantis will do. It'll help us, it'll actually help an independent media rise and it, and it will let the, the archaic media uh, just kind of fall away. 
just to get back a bit to the part where we were talking about separating public and private, and uh, both of you mentioned this, how this was a cornerstone of our civilization. And I think that's true, and I think it was only the Judeo-Christian civilization this, which had this. Uh, and where I want to go from here is that I think this is on purpose. So they want to destroy this, because actually I don't think they want to live in a, a kind of an Orwellian a society, which we talk about a lot. I think it's much more sinister. I think they want to live in a brave new world. Uh, and I think all the, you know, going after the kids, uh, kind of, uh, you know, the drug addiction problem, the porn problem, is all about kind of lulling people into this uh, place where they don't really realize that they are living under authoritarian and dictatorship. So I just was interested, how do you see that? Do you think this is really happening? Uh, and also, kind of, what can we do uh, against this? Uh, how, how do we kind of get after these issues? Because I, I think it's not just schools. For example, the psychologists are full of this. So if, let's say, a 12-year-old kid will go with depression to a psychologist, they will also say to that kid that you might have kind of, you know, some trans <laughs> gender issue going on. You're not depressed. You must be in the wrong body. So it's not just schools. It's everywhere, basically. Look, we have to understand we are in a, a, a technological revolution and we're in the adolescence of that. It's funny, I don't have my phone. I usually have my phone on me like you guys all the time. I handed it to my assistant right before we started. But every one of you have an iPhone in your pocket and you have access to more information than anyone could have ever possibly imagined in the history of humanity. But it, it's a tool. It, it's sort of like fire, right? Like fire is great. It can warm up your house and cook your food, but fire can also burn you and burn down that house. We haven't figured out how to behave with these things yet. And then the algorithm sort of went crazy, now there's ChatGPT and OpenAI, and we're finding out that that has incredible political bias, and, and the way that it's rewiring our brains. You know, for anyone here that's over probably 35, you might remember, remember the beginning of the internet when you would go to a website, right? You'd go to ESPN.com, and they had 20 stories, and you'd scroll down to the bottom, and then it was done, right? You were at the end of the internet. It was amazing. It was over. The road was there. You were, that was it. But then, uh, what was it, about 15? years ago, I, I forget the guy's name, they, he invented infinite scroll. And now we have infinite scroll. You, on every app, on every web page you go to, it never stops. So now try to hand that to a kid. We all know what it does to us as adults. Infinite scroll. You can go on Twitter and you see a terrorist attack and then you see a picture of a baby and then Joe Biden said something stupid. And then, this, and then you know, and it's like, what is that doing to us? What, you know, we are just bouncing around between hyper crazy emotions on top of the fact that it's actually manipulated information in ways that we don't understand, as, as Elon talked about, you know, not only did the government uh, have access to Twitter, but he also had activists at the company writing code. So he still doesn't know how to unfurl all of that. That when I, when I met with him a few months ago, that was my main takeaway. It's like, it's not just that he had to buy this thing and correct it. He has a, he has a ship that is, that is completely rotted on the inside. And he's not even sure if that ship uh, needs to be replaced altogether rather than just fixed. But the point is all of these things are manipulating us in crazy ways. And yes, in a, in a sense, why, why is there this push to get us all on the metaverse? Why would you want to follow Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook into, you know, basically into Ready Player One, if any of you saw the, the movie or read the book? Why would you want to follow him there? Did, 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 you know, did these things hand us... Let's put it this way. How many of us are more social because of social media, right? I mean, I would say, I would say virtually nobody. We're more angst-ridden. We're, uh, we're more neurotic and all of those things. So I think figuring out a way to, to behave, but it's personal, right? I, I'm not for passing a law that you can't use your phone a certain amount of time or any of that kind of stuff. And I think it should be up to the parents regarding the children. But yes, we have handed 12-year-olds the world the sum totality of the knowledge of human history and, and let it be manipulated and then handed it to them, say, go into your room, figure it out. And then we wonder why everybody's crazy. Posey Parker, the activist in yeah. England, who uh, anti-trans feminist, she was on a podcast with Louise Perry the other day, and she said that she believes the trans phenomenon is just the tip of the iceberg, that it is the first step towards the war for reality. Mm -hmm that uh, when AI comes in and transhumanism comes in and all that, we are going to have to fight a tremendous battle just to see, to, to keep our, our heads in what is real. And uh, I think that's- What, really what is human? 
because I think the AI stuff and all the you know uh, robotic things coming in is is really looking at what is human, and I think that's really frightening because in the end, what is the question to it? I don't want you know robots coming on saying we're human and we have a soul. We're already talking about AI having a soul, which is just very frightening to me. Well, it's interesting because every sci-fi movie that we've ever seen, whether you watch the movie AI or Total Recall or The Matrix or whatever sci-fi movie you liked as a kid, it's all coming to be right now, right? It really is all coming to be right now. We are the bat. The, what was the purpose of the movie The Matrix? The, the humans were the batteries for the digital world, in essence. That's really what the movie was summed, uh, if you just whittled it down, that's what it was about. And we are basically giving ourselves to this thing. We may not be able to stop it. Uh, and yes, I do think that the trans, the trans thing seems to be, and again, that's why they're going for the kids. We're all going to age out, right? I'm not that old, but we're all going to age out. But if you can now break the reality of a whole generation of kids who are five to 12, and they will have no idea of what history was or what is real, or literally that their body parts connotate something to their reality, uh, you're going to have major problems. And I, I do think that is a huge problem. Uh, you know, one other thing on that, because it came up a couple times today, you know, I think one thing that could possibly be done a little bit with this is that you know we have this this thing this LGBT community and the T is the most anti LGB thing on earth it is the most anti gay movement that you could possibly have it really is it, you, because in essence what the what the trans community is saying is they're they're finding a 5 year old boy who happens to maybe be a little bit effeminate and he likes Star Wars and Transformers more than he likes Barbie let's say and they're saying you're actually not a boy you're a girl and now we're going to put you on hormones and all these procedures. And maybe, maybe, and hopefully he would grow up, if, if not for this, to be a somewhat functional adult. By the way, he might grow up to be a straight guy too, because there are effeminate straight guys and there are, you know, all, all that's the gestalt of life. Um, but it, the same thing would go for a girl. You might find a girl who's a little bit more of a tomboy and they would now say, oh no, you're actually a boy. So they, they are coming for absolutely everything. But I would say to the, you know, that, that the gay community, and I hate the phrase community, should be fighting this probably on, on the forefront of this because it's it's them first. And by the way, it's the feminists too. I mean, the, the, it's the women the that curves. should be... Yeah, when you watch a guy, you know, crush a woman in wrestling and then you applaud as a feminist, <laughs> you, you may have to reevaluate the situation. You know, you were talking about how new uh, barriers are breaking down in this new environment and how new alliances are forming. Barry Weiss and I uh, talked about this same thing a couple of years ago. She said uh, before the Great Awakening... She said, if you would have ever said I would be on the same side as Rod Dreher about anything, I never would have believed it. But here we are, yep. because we're both fighting the same therapeutic totalitarianism. This is one of the things I learned from talking to pe interviewing people who stayed behind and resisted communism in Central Europe. They said that whenever you find allies, people who are courageous... You, you have to stand with them no matter what you disagree on. Mm -hmm. This one woman, Camilla Bendova in Prague, she and her husband were the only political conservatives and religious people in the, at the top level of the Czech resistance. She said, Rod, you mustn't imagine that other Christians had courage. They didn't. They kept their heads down like, like uh, everybody else did. My husband and I saw these hippies, Václav Havel and the others. They, they didn't agree with us on a lot of things, but they had courage to stand up to totalitarianism. And we knew they would be with us when the secret police came, and they knew they could count on us. I think that courage uh, of people like Brett Weinstein, Heather Hying, uh, Peter Bogosian, and others, that is the, the glue that can keep us together, even whether we're on the left or the right. Yeah, well, look, there's, there's something that does bridge the political divide, and that's truth, right? I mean, that, that would probably be the great thing that dr dr drives that. So some of those names you mentioned, the, the, these are lefties. Uh, these are good friends of mine. I mean, Brett, Barry, uh, Peter. Uh, I know Peter, Peter, I'm pretty sure, is going to move to Hungary any day now. I mean, he has seen the, he has seen the promised land, as he has told me many times. Um, and he's an atheist still, which I think he's probably, he'll get out of that soon enough too. But, you know... Uh, He's he's on he's on the road, let's say, but he believes in freedom. He believes in, in in many of the things we've discussed here. But you have to find those people. You know, since Jordan, since I mentioned Jordan earlier, and he's coming here tomorrow. When we were on tour, one line he would change the speech all the time. But he had a couple lines that would uh, occasionally repeat. He would ask the crowd, "How many of you would think you would have been Nazis in 1933 Germany?" 
Now, nobody raises their hand, right? <laughs> no, oh, yes, I would have been a Nazi. <laughs> no, nobody raises their hand. And, he, and then he would always respond the same way. That means you probably would have been a Nazi. Because these things don't just magically appear. They appear by our acquiescence. As I said earlier, they appear because we are not brave. We, and we also don't have many models to be brave. And I also think it's partly, that was the real uh, twisted message of, uh, of cancel culture. And it's something that Trump really got right. You know, when Trump always says, they're not coming after me, they're coming after you, I'm just standing in the way. He really is right about that. Tucker, they're not, re when, they, when they were always going to get rid of Tucker's advertisers, it's not really that they fear Tucker that much. It's that they figure he's a signal boost to everybody else to go, oh, well, I can say some things that aren't just the mainstream claptrap of the day. And we just need more and more people to be brave. But, but that, that really is the first challenge here. And what advice would you give people who want to be brave? Because I think you're a very good example. I mean, you have been a progressive. You left uh, Young Turks, started your own YouTube channel. So let's say to Tucker now, he's, he's fired. Uh, what can he do? Because I think it's really important, but, and you mentioned this, that if they're not brave enough, they will just trample us. Let me just say something briefly about bravery because people say this to me all the time and I, and I understand, like I, I say what I think for a living. Sometimes I think it's just kind of naivete or stupidity or something. But when I was in Israel last week, the amount of people coming up to me and saying, Dave, you're so brave. And I'm going, you literally were in Gaza. Like you, you have lived through things that I can old, that I would never want to imagine. So, you know, bravery, I would say is a little bit on a, on a spectrum, but, but in a, in a functioning free society, Unfortunately, I suppose it is brave to some extent. I would say, know this, like I can't give it to you in a, in a Pollyannish, uh, uh, Pollyannish sort of way. Bad things will happen. You will say what you think, and you know what? Your wife or husband might be really pissed at you. Your kids might turn on you. You, you might be in trouble at work, all sorts of things. Actually, when I, when I first uh, was leaving the left, so to speak, and suddenly I was getting all this hate from the people that I thought were the, the purported tolerant ones and diverse ones and all that. And I was, every day I would wake up and my email would be blowing up, hard, like the worst unimaginable things and Twitter and all that. I actually developed an autoimmune disease in the middle of that. I developed alopecia areata, which I'm sure some of you know of. It's when you lose huge yeah. chunks of your hair. Some people lose literally all their hair. And I was just waking up with chunks of my hair just falling out every day. I was probably, I'd probably lost like almost half of, uh, of the hair on my head. It's all, it's all back now because I changed my stress habits and things like that. But I mentioned that because you will go through some bad shit, pardon my French. You, it, it is just the reality of it. There is no way to sit here and say to you with a straight face, yes, go out there and say what you think about the world and it's just going to be great. Like It will not. But what is the option? And I guess that's the part that I don't have in me anymore. I, I don't know what the option is. I have to do it. And I, and I think it's probably the most important thing you can do as a human. This is Rod, can I prompt you to talk about your conversation with Peter Krakow on exactly that point? That? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what John's talking about is when I was first here in the summer of 2021, I was a, a fellow at the Danube Institute, and I asked them, can you introduce me to someone from the anti-Orban opposition? I just want to get a feel for why they oppose, oppose him. So I was taken to meet this guy, Peter Krako, who is a, a liberal and outspoken anti-Orban figure, but by all accounts, an honest man. So I sat, he's a professor. I sat down with him in his office and said, why are you against the government? He said, well, I think it's corrupt, and plus I'm in favor of, of same-sex marriage. This government is not. Uh, but on the trans thing, I'm just not sure. And then we went on to talk about other things. At the end of the conversation, he said, but you know, in, in the end, I can stand here in my classroom in Budapest and say whatever I want about the government and no one will bother me. I said, Peter, that's really interesting because in the United States, you could say anything you wanted about anything and the government won't bother you. But if you said what you did at first, that you're in favor of same-sex marriage, but you're just not sure about trans, you would probably have some students who would report you to to the, uh, the administration, say they had been harmed, you would have to be in a star chamber defending your job, and if you got fired, you would never work again. So who has more freedom, Peter? You here in Orban's Hungary or your counterpart in America? It just had not occurred to him, because mm -hmm. he just didn't know that that's what it is. And it's not, th this is what I, I was talking about earlier about um, Orban understanding that power is exercised not only by the, by the state, but also informally by these institutions. I wanted to say quickly, too, that 
I think this fear of suffering is the basis of this soft, therapeutic, brave new world totalitarianism we have. We have created uh, one or two generations of people who are terrified of suffering, mm -hmm. or even of anxiety, of, of relatively mild suffering. When I interviewed people in Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Russia about what's the most important lesson that Americans and others facing soft totalitarianism can take about how to resist, they all said the most important one was develop a willingness and a capability to suffer for the truth. Because uh, they can hurt you, they can fire you, they can take away your liberty, they can do all of these things, but they cannot take away your integrity. This is what Solzhenitsyn meant yeah. by saying, live not by lies. He said, if you stand in the truth and are willing to suffer for it, ultimately the kingdom of lies will fall. I don't know how many of you... I don't know how many of you saw the movie. It was a Tom Hanks movie that more people should have seen with Halle Berry, Berry Cloud Atlas. Did, did many of you see that? It is an absolutely wonderful sci-fi movie. And the main, line, the main line of the movie is, I will not be subjected to criminal abuse. And we are all subjecting ourselves to criminal abuse constantly. When we know that the truth is being assaulted and we just sit there and do nothing, we are giving it the oxygen to come for everything. So, you know, the other part of this is at, at sort of the sci-fi level and the 1984 level, we, we may be far worse in some ways. This will be my, I'm usually a, a red pill guy or a, uh, I try to give the white pill. Is like, like the red pill is when you wake up to the world as it is. And the white pill is like a, a very positive vision of the future. Black pill would be the negative version of the future. I try to be as much of a white pill guy as possible. The black pill version of it would be that we are so deep within the, the technological uh, march towards totalitarian control. We're so deep in it already, we don't even know it. And, th and that, you know, in essence, that would sort of be like, you know, the, the uh, Skynet has turned on from Terminator, something like that. We might be there already, but what kind of person do you want to be if we're there already? Do you want to be someone that, that just goes with it, or do you want to see, be someone that stops it? I think probably if you're here, you want to be somebody that stops it. On that very point, in the last, I would say, six weeks, um, there have been a whole series of revelations about institutions like Hamilton 68, I think it is, um, the, and the organizations that were set up um, really uh, in the last five or six years in the American government to control and to deter um, expressions of points of view that were uh, are manifestly false, damaging, or whatever. Um, I think, for example, the, the first um, real uh, adventure in that, of that kind was the attempt by institutions of the government, the media, um, high, big tech, and so on, to argue that um, Trump was a Russian asset. Mm -hmm. This was something that was said again and again and again. It was believed, I, be I think sincerely believed by um, people in positions of authority and influence in the media. It was false from beginning to end. People who resisted this were vilified. They were themselves described as Russian assets and so on, or, uh, in, or sometimes uh, naive uh, imitators of Russian propaganda. Um, how uh, you you are yourself active against that in a very in several ways. One of which was mentioned before your support for a free enterprise. For a, I'm sorry, not free enterprise, but a free uh, internet and media. I wonder if you'd want to tell us how serious um, this black pill version of events now seems. I, the thing is, we don't know because Google, like again. We are all walking around with either an iPhone or an Android device in our pocket right now. Is that thing tracking you everywhere you, you go? Probably. Is that thing listening to you at all times? Probably. How many times have you been talking to somebody and suddenly Siri starts transcribing what you're saying into a text message, right? Like these things happen. You're talking about something privately with a friend and next thing you know, you get an ad for that thing on Instagram. All of we, these things are just happening, right? You get phantom buzzes in your pocket, like the litany of, of weird things. And yet no one's putting the phone down. I try not to be on social media on the weekends. And for six years in a row, actually, I've done off the grid August where I have no phone, no computer, no news 
news, no TV for a month. It's actually one of the things that I think in, if for somebody that does politics on a daily basis, which makes everybody crazy, I think it's one of the things that's kept me roughly sane, ball, ballpark sane, let's say, over these last couple of years. Um, we, the black pill version is that they've sort of got us already and, and there's no way out. I, I just, I don't fundamentally believe that because as long, as long, look, the human spirit, the humans have been through, you know, genocides and humans have been through world wars and holocausts and the, uh, the endless history of the world, which is unbelievably brutal. And actually, if you look at the world right now, uh, a couple things notwithstanding, it's fairly peaceful right now. We're in, we're in like sort of an information war, but you know, we're, we don't have massive genocides across the world right now. That's not really the default behavior of humans. So things are relatively good to some extent, uh, but we just have to figure out what our relationship will be with that, that digital world, because otherwise we will just be the, the batteries for it. You know, I, um, you, you said that you've been to Israel, you're in Hungary trying to figure out what you can take back to America that can help us with the we Americans' the struggles we're, we're dealing with. I think that the Israelis and the Hungarians have something we don't, and that is they have a more or less homogeneous uh, eth ethnicity, ethnos. Um, Hungary is mostly Hungarian. Israel is mostly Jewish. You know, they share ethnicity and they share religion. Um, we don't have that in America, mm -hmm. and it's by design, you know, and that's why you can't just plug and play Hungary to America. Another thing that both countries have is they're small, and they faced, for their entire existence, threats to their very existence. Mm -hmm. um, and so they've had to learn the hard way limits. You know, we in the United States don't even understand what limits are. And so just this week, I read that there was a report from the Government Accounting Office saying that the U.S. Navy can't deploy ships. We're yep. falling far behind in deploying ships. But the U.S. Navy sure can find time to create an official drag queen digital ambassador, right? Yeah. You tell that to Hungarians, and they look at you like, oh, come on. I'm like, no, 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 it's, it's real, it's happening. So I guess what I, I would ask you, Dave, is um, how... Can you look at the, at the strengths that Israel and Hungary have, but how can we make use of them in America when we have a very different history and very different demography and a very different geographical situation? Yeah, well, first off, in my limited time, I'm only here for another day and a half, but this is exactly what I want to find out more about from the Hungarian perspective, because I really did find it out from the Israelis' perspective, and I think you're right about that. And I also think, you know, in their case specifically, although Hungary's had external problems, their external problems have been so so nonstop for the entire existence that it whittled some, it whittled a piece of coal into a diamond in essence. But I'll tell you something that I, that I learned there that was really interesting. So they're in the midst of this uh, judicial reform situation right now. And without getting too far into it, basically the, the right believes that the, the judiciary there has too much legislative power. The left feels that if they give up that power, that uh, ultimately will give the religious people too much power over their lives. So it really is a battle of secular versus religious there. So I really went out of my way, just like you talked to that professor. I thought, I want to talk to people on both sides. It's very easy for me to talk to people on the right, but I really want to talk to people on the left on this. And I sat down with a girl yesterday and we had coffee in Tel Aviv and she's a full leftist there. And she told me something that was really amazing. She kept, well, first of all, she didn't tell it to me. She didn't t say it specifically, but it became obvious as we were talking. She kept talking about how much she loved the country. And she said that, you know, at all these protests, the, the anti-reform protests, uh, there are Israeli flags everywhere and they're talking about the history of the country and the founding of the country and the importance of the country and, and the historical significance and all of these things. And I thought, this, now that's something because this is very different than the left in America. So in America, it's just don't take my word for it. Take AOC's word for it. Take Ilhan Omar's word for it. Uh, take Kamala Harris's word for it. Take virtually any mainstream Democrat's word for it. They will tell you that the founding of America was, a, was flawed. It was based in slavery. It was based in racism. It was based in the patriarchy and misogyny and all of these things. So when the left is out there protesting and when they're burning down cities and BLM and Antifa and all these things, 
they're not out there saying, oh, we love America. We're just trying to fix a few of these things. They're literally out there saying we are trying to upend America. I thought that that's a really interesting difference. It sounds to me like that's also the difference that you may have here, because if that professor represents anything of your left, that's the left that you want to strengthen. You might ultimately, everyone in this room might have differences ultimately on certain policies when it comes uh, to, to your left here. But if they're not bananas, if they're not out of control like our left is in America, you really do want to strengthen them if you want to live in a free society. Now, it will be tricky because you will be frustrated with them all the time, right? Because you're going to want them to, to come to your side, so to speak. But if in America we had a somewhat sane left right now and we were just arguing, instead of arguing whether America is fundamentally decent, we were arguing about marginal tax rates and we were arguing about immigration, well, that's what a Western society can do and can flourish by doing. You know, that, that's, what, that's what human communication is all about. Um, but I think that's a fundamental difference. And that's also why identity politics is so dangerous. Diversity is not our strength. It's a nice piece of something sometimes, but it's not a strength in and of itself. So when they've gone out of their way to say America, which has taken in all of these people from everywhere, that you must focus on your identity, which was more important in the place that you fled than the place that you came to, it is designed, it is a bomb in the system designed to destroy the system. And that's what we have to watch out for. I think, uh, you know, what President, uh, Prime Minister Orban actually said that big countries have the luxury to be stupid, while small countries don't have that because we will, you know, get destroyed. Uh, and I think that's what is the case. Although I'm not sure that our left is actually much better than your left because they are getting indoctrinated with all the crazy stuff coming from America. But I had a similar experience, let's say, in Estonia. They also, they know how to, you know, uh, they had to survive a very small nation. And I think Israel is a bit the same in this sense. I only have one last question before we open up it for the, for the audience. And we kind of have been beating around the bush uh, around this topic. Uh, I mean, uh, you mentioned, for example, the don't say gay bill. Uh, and of course, uh, the progressive media in America, but even here in Hungary, a lot of people think that actually Ron DeSantis was inspired by what Hungary did, which is very similar. So my really question is here is, uh, do you think that Ron DeSantis is taking cues from Orban or <laughs> as somebody who is, is working close together with him? Oh, I actually thought you were going to ask me something else, which I may as well address. I happen to be gay. I don't know if any of you know that or care or anything else. I'm married. I've been with my partner for like 15 years. We've been married for... I should know this off the top of my head, but about 10 years. Uh, as as and long as you don't want to go into schools and, you know, yeah. uh, dress as a drag queen and yeah, yeah, say yeah. to kids that it's fine, we're okay with Yeah, it. this is about <laughs> as crazy as I dress. Um, we have two kids. I think the gay thing happens to be probably the least interesting thing about me. I'm not here to tell anyone. I don't think being gay is inherently good or, or bad. I think it's part of the human condition and it's part of, it's part of the... Uh, the animal kingdom, right? Penguins and everything else. Um, the fat, but you know, Jordan talks about this a lot. You know, every society uh, should have should sort of have an ideal model that you'd be striving towards, right? So the the ideal model that that everyone should be striving towards, and this is where certain like little words could be a little tricky here. So bear with me. The ideal model that we know that works for for societies, obviously, is a father and a mother and children beneath that, and grandparents above that, and that's how you sort of model things out and build a, a bottom up society, and that's how families flourish. That we we know this, but that doesn't mean it has to be the only thing. And I think what you would want to do in a free society is say, oh, there are people who are a little bit different, and what are the what are the margin cases that we can do something with when people want to live full, flourishing lives? Do you want to push these people all the way to the margins and, and, and basically push them out of society and then God knows what happens to them there and what they will then push back on you? Or do you want to have a society that can say, Here, here's sort of the standard, right? Here's the standard. And then there, there is room for other people around that. Uh, so that's just to address that, which I think is important to address, by the way, because even when I tweeted out that I was coming here, everyone said, they're going to come get you. And, blah, and I was like, I don't know, we'll see. But so far, everyone's been quite nice. So... Uh, <laughs> but I've only been with you guys, so. Um, so uh, was your question what, whether Ron DeSantis is taking cues? Oh, taking from cues. Orban. I, I, I don't know anything that, that you don't know, let's put it that way. But it seems clear to me, even from this conversation that we're having here, that the, the wise 
Western leaders at the moment are seeing the same things. The same problems that you guys are seeing from a Hungarian perspective are the things that we're seeing from an American perspective. They're almost exactly the same. They're not exactly the same, right? Like you guys have different problems with immigration than we have our immigration problem, by the way, in the last three days or something. It's like, it's exploding. Absolutely. We're doing exactly what Europe did seven years ago. We are just letting everybody in right now. And then it's like, we'll end up where Germany Germany's at right now, and uh, you know, hopefully not. But uh, it seems like it all could all head in that direction. So I don't know specifically. I don't know that they're talking about this sort of stuff. But I sense it's fairly obvious. If if you are a functioning, decent person, there are obvious problems right now, and there are some solutions that are going to be tricky and have some pain associated with them. And the media will treat you horribly. But as DeSantis says all the time, the more the media attacks him, the more he knows he's doing the right thing. I, I suspect that's what's going on here as well. Yeah. Sure. Could I just now say that there are four people on the platform. We do disagree about certain things, but it's, there's probably a general commonality of outlook and interest. Uh, is there anyone in the audience here today who so far um, w would like to ask a question because they disagree strongly with something that seems to be... Um, uh, I'm sorry? Uh, oh, they disagree with... Uh, with what you've heard, or maybe you think well, that particularly um, uh, Dave Rubin, but all of us too, are missing something and we ought to be aware of. Is there anybody who would like to raise um, a, a hand on that? Oh. Yes, Lee. Yes. Uh. It's not as much a disagreement as something that, that, ben, that Dave said that um, gave me uh, pause, and that was, he mentioned sort of the age of our American politicians. Now, Victor Orban is a babe in the woods compared to our politicians, and Rishi Sunak is even is in the womb compared to our politicians, and likewise, Emmanuel Macron. Uh, but what you said was that they're defending a, a world that no longer exists or something. But my question is, if indeed that is true, then why are they so easily pulled along into these radical woke things? Why, why aren't they standing their ground for the wisdom of former times? Yeah, it, it's a great question. I think in the, I can answer it most easily in the case of Joe Biden, where he obviously has severe cognitive problems. We all know it. Everyone knows it. Every speech where he can't say two words, literally two words in a row without stammering. He shakes hands with the air. He walks off in the wrong direction. Uh, on Easter Sunday, did you see that last year on Easter Sunday where they literally sent the Easter bunny to go talk to him to move him away from people in the crowd? Like, it, it's so out of control there. And so I, so he is no longer the person. He's in the body of Joe Biden, but he's not. he's not cognitively there enough which is, which, yeah, no, so some of them are. So, right, okay, so on the case of those people, I think this is where you gotta give the devil his due. I think the left has done something amazing and we all may hate it. We may hate what the left has done to all of our societies, but you have got to give them credit. They have destroyed so much so quickly and they have taken so many people and twisted them into saying things that they never would have said, uh, you know, five, 10, 20 years ago. If you took Nancy Pelosi, 20 years ago, Chuck Schumer 20 years ago, these were not crazy radical leftists, but they decided to let the inmates run the asylum. I would say it's a flaw, it's a character flaw probably, it's a flaw probably in belief, and it's a flaw that, that politics just kind of breaks people. Yeah, I think in the case of Nancy Pelosi specifically, she saw these these young girls come in and the media loved them. And there's probably some, uh, we could probably get some biblical story if someone can figure it out. The older woman who wanted to steal all the power from the younger women, something like that. And she wanted that. She wanted to just be part of that. And clearly it didn't end well for her. And, and the question is, how, how much of America will it take with it? And I, I think in the question of the right, the normally Republicans, the older Republicans, are terrified of the donor class, ter terrified of the woke capitalists who are very much on the left socially and really only care about keeping their tax breaks. And I think that the older Republicans just don't 
know how to resist business. Asa Hutchinson, who's governor of Arkansas, running for president now, you know, he is one of these people Dave was talking about, one of these normally Republicans who tut tuts Tucker and Ron DeSantis for for being critical of big business. I mean, that's that's so of another generation, but they just, they don't know what time it is to use a Claremont Institute phrase. <laughs> yes. yeah. Next question, a gentleman here, and then later. Hello, Dave. So nice to see you here in Hungary. I have a provocative question for you, uh, which is regarding the 2024 presidential elections. Is there a possibility that if Trump wins the Republican nomination, we will see Trump who will shout his things towards President Biden and people will vote for Biden because the American voters will see an angry orange man and not a reasonable and successful governor like DeSantis? Well, I'm, I think I missed the part in the middle. So is the question if Trump becomes president? So if Trump gets the Republican nomination by the RNC, is there yeah. a chance that the same thing will happen in 2024 during the presidential debate between Biden and Trump, that the people will see that orange man is bad and we will vote for Biden because... Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think there's very little chance that Trump becomes president. I think there's a numbers problem. There's a reality problem. Look, Trump got 70... If, if we're to believe the last election was legit, so that's a whole other conversation. But if we're basically to believe that, then we're to believe that Joe Biden, who basically didn't campaign, got 81 million votes, the most votes in American history, and Donald Trump got the second most votes in American history, 75 million. The question just on a numbers level is where is a new Trump voter? Who, who is the person that finally now is like, yes, now I get it, I'm voting for Trump? Really doesn't exist. Now, you could argue that there'd be a lot less Trump voters. People are tired of, of the craziness. You know, a lot of the attacks on DeSantis in the last month, they just have not worked. It's partly because it's so patently not true. When Trump goes out there and says Florida's horrible and all of these things, it's like, what? or that DeSantis is a globalist and a rhino. It's like, this is not working. If, if he is a globalist and a rhino, then we're all globalists and rhinos. The guy doing everything we all are asking for, doing it in the more efficient way than we could have ever imagined, and Trump's going after him. So Trump has a problem in that I don't know where the new Trump voter is. DeSantis doesn't have that problem. DeSantis, it's fairly obvious. He can get all the, the, the guys that you're talking about. I can't wait for DeSantis to be the nominee so I can look Brett Weinstein in the eye and Pete Bogosian and all of my Democrat friends and say, so are you going to vote for him? Yes or no? Because do you believe in anything that you have? I've tried this with them many times. He's the guy that can bring over the crossover people, which is why he just won in, in a huge landslide. Uh, I think Trump also has a problem, which is that if he, if he genuinely believes that the election was stolen, which I believe him on his word that he does, well, then how does it make sense you're running again if you haven't done anything to solve the problem related to that in terms of ballot harvesting and everything else? So you have a problem in that you can't get new voters. We just don't know where they are. And if you, if you believe the thing you're telling us you believe, they're going to just do it to you again. So I, so I, to me, that's a recipe for, for Biden, too, if Biden even makes it that far. Good. Thank you. The gentleman here. Gentleman the baseball cap, I think. That's fair. I was the second... <coughs> Okay, so recently in the last few years, I really got disillusioned by the idea to divide people by the left and the right ideologies. Um, I think it's much more clear if we look at each other on exactly what do we think on certain issues. And you are looking for solutions, you know, to uh, have platforms for free speech to go around all these uh, shenanigans which the US government did, maybe through Twitter or the shadow banning, all these things. Don't you think if the demolition of these I am left, I am right thing changes and we more look at what we really think and discuss on that basis and we don't divide ourselves based on left and right? Like, for example, I agree with you on most of the things we spoke today, migration and this trans ideology craziness, but still I oppose our government, you know, on many things. Uh, but still, you know, most of the things we agree on, so why do we have to put ourselves on a different side of a, you know, a division? 
It's, it's probably a good question for everybody up here. I, I would say briefly, and I used to talk about this a lot, sort of how the labels don't fit anymore. And, you know, I think instead of left and right, you could basically say authoritarian or libertarian. Do you believe in, you know, sort of centralized control or do you believe in individual aut autonomy? Because then, then you're not sort of attaching that to all of the political, you know, the policy prescriptions to all of those things. I think the, the real reason that we sort of do this is you need a little shorthand to talk to groups about basic things, right? So it's just somewhat of a way, otherwise we would get lost in every little thing. What do you mean by left? Also, again, having just come from Israel, Israel has a more socialist system, right? They have a more left system because they have socialized healthcare. The country started uh, with kibbutzes. So these were communal uh, thing, you know, community, community organizations that nobody owned that all worked for together. That might really work on uh, micro levels, but then they, as they became more successful, they grew out of it and became more capitalist. So a lot of the definitions don't quite work. For me, it's usually just shorthand. But trust me, when I hear that you have some level of a, of a somewhat sane left here, uh, that's very happy to hear. Because of course, not everybody is is that far gone. I think the question is, can you strengthen those people enough to, to stop the, the worst parts of it? I think that uh, a great Hungarian-American, John Lukács, said it very well uh, some years ago. He said, the future is going to be between people who believe that they want to live under the machine and people who want to live as human beings. And I think you can find people who are on, would identify on the political left or right who could, who are in both, uh, take both sides there. Like the, the guys we were talking about, Peter Bergosi and these others, they're on the, in the American left-wing tradition, but Peter, when he came here to Budapest uh, a year ago, he, he had written to me, by the way, the, uh, a few months earlier. We didn't know each other, but he said, listen, I've been offered a fellowship at MCC, uh, Matthias Corvinus Collegium here, and I'm, a, I'm an atheist. I'm on the left. I don't know. I, I hear that Hungary is really conservative. I said, Peter, I think you should take it because you're coming from super woke West Coast University. Uh, if you come here, you'll find that it's generally uh, on the right at this school. But the thing that's going to hit you most of all is it's possible to have a real conversation there. People there are interested in what you have to say and in dialoguing with you. Nobody's going to try to cancel you or run you down. That's what we used to have in America, and we don't anymore. They still have it in Hungary. Well, I came here back for a second time at Danube a month after Peter had arrived. And as Dave said, Peter came up to me and it was like he had found the promised land. Yeah, he he could not believe how good it was here. And to me, that is a testimony to how bad things have gotten crazy in America. And eventually his woke university drove him out, even though he is a left-wing atheist, because they have this machine-like view of, what, of how society should be organized. It must be uh, shoved into this ideological form, and they don't want to give people the chance to be messy and human. Can I just come in on that? Because I think that th this comes up a lot, obviously. The political, we're in a period of political realignment. Uh, that's the, the, the truth of the matter. But I have to, the probably for you, gloomy conclusion that in the end, the, these different questions will settle together on a left-right basis. And the, the, the reason is this, that there are people who believe in a freer economy or a more regulated one. There are people who believe in a, in a more conventional culture and a more bohemian one. The people who believe, oddly enough, in um, bohemian culture tend themselves to prefer um, uh, not freer economies, but more regulated ones. The people who believe in uh, free economies tend to prefer a more solid culture. I can, I can give you a good theoretical reason for that. Free economic societies need morally upright people to make sure they go effectively. But when it comes down to it, the choice, that, you know, the compromise that you, for example, feel you have to make at the moment um, uh, is somewhat uh, less serious than you may think. Uh, here's the reason. Um, that however, if you are, for example, a believer in a free economy um, and a strong cult a cu culture, however much a conservative party, like the Tory party in England, um, 
imitates the left economically and becomes more restrictive, it's never going to be as restrictive as the Labour Party. So you're always going to have a reason for voting for the right, even when you disapprove of its economic policies. And the same is true for culture. So at the end of the day, the left-right thing makes sense over the long term but not all the time. There are periods when it goes into flux and it takes time to settle down to the, to the new uh, opinions that have erupted, I think. But, but John, can I just push back on that a little yeah. bit? That's changing in the United States now. There was a piece in uh, Politico, or maybe a left magazine, saying that Tucker Carlson's economic populism is breaking the brains of the left. You know, and you're seeing now emerge, I mean, Gladden Pappen, who's here with us, he's an American conservative intellectual who is pushing um, for uh, what would be considered, I think it's fair to say, a more left-wing version of economics, but he's coming at it from the right because he believes correctly that the most important thing for any government to do is to protect the family. And there's no doubt that, there's, there's no doubt is that a that fair Gladden, I'll take off my, doff my top hat to you, but the fact of the matter is also um, that the, uh, your um, path is made easier by the fact that the corporations have gone in a radical moral direction, which means that a lot of people on, on, the, on the right are disturbed by the anti-free speech attitude on the one hand, uh, the def support for transgender policies of an extreme kind imposed by the threat of, of uh, firing, uh, dismissal, that these things are out, strike most conservatives who are also free marketers as outrageous. And I think that's, well, as I say, we're in a period of realignment. I, yeah. I, think, I think you can also see that. I mean, I think the clearest example from an American perspective is look at Tucker's position on the Russia-Ukraine war. He's the most sort of isolationist or what, you, what he would call America first, you know, get out of this war, this is going to end up in World War III. That used to be the position of the left, right? Was The left was the anti-war party. Bernie Sanders, you would think, would be leading the charge against World War III. But he's voting for all of the money that we are sending over there and all of the arms and everything else. And, in, in, you know, it, this is a whole other topic, but in essence, we are now bankrolling this massive war that... I would argue we are in. We have no congressional authorization for it or anything else. Yeah. But the point is that this, that's a very fundamental flip on what someone might traditionally say left and right. Wait a minute. The le I thought the left is the peace people, and it's those scary conservatives who want Th this war. This panel and, is yeah. divided on that, by the way. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. I don't I'm not even commenting on that two, specifically. Two three yeah. to one, but yeah. it's divided. Yeah. No, but, but think about it. In, now that they've gotten rid of Tucker and maybe Rupert Murdoch having had two conversations by phone with Zelensky in March might have had something to do with that, but Tucker's gone. Name a single major media figure in the United States who is critical of U.S. government policy on the war. It's hard to do. Um, no, they're actually cheering it. I mean, again, yep. turn on MSNBC. That is the lefty MSNBC. They, if all of the cheerleaders are there. Yep. And, and on the major mainstream figures on the right, most yep. of them are for the war. I don't want to debate the morality of the war, but you would think that in a country as big as the United States, there would be at least some other voice, but it's not. It's a uniparty. Here in Orban's Hungary, you know, Orban is against NATO policy in the war. It's easier to find anti-government commentary in the media than it is in the United States. What does that tell you? Probably everything you need to know, and that's, again, why our mainstream media... It, it has to be done with. I, I am that. That is why my biggest criticism right now of Trump is that he will just keep it going. If you want this craziness to continue with the media, then the guy you want is Trump because he is the guy who cares about ratings. He cares about who's talking about him and all of those things. He will continually feed it. Again, I, I, it, this is sort of like people look at this thing as like a little nothing. But DeSantis starting to say to these people, I will no longer talk to you. You do not do the job you were set out to do do. That is the way out of this. And yeah, I wish we had more uh, anti-war people in America, Re again, regardless of fully debating all the uh, specifics about the war. I just wish we had less of a uniparty on war, on economics, on any number of things. This is what the real value of Tucker Carlson was. He would have people on his show that you wouldn't see anywhere else mm -hmm. on the media. People from the left he would have on because he found them interesting and thought they had something important to say. And he's gone now. That's gone. Well, look, we have the infrastructure to free him, right? I mean, he can... We're, 
I can only say so much, but like there's plenty of operations right now trying to make sure that Tucker has a bright future. I would say Rumble is the is the number one. If you want Tucker out there saying whatever he wants to say on an uncancelable platform and making plenty of money while he's doing it, like that that to me is the place to go. It might end up that Elon might just sit down with him and say, let's do this thing together. Like there, there are options, but yes, it will not come from the mainstream media. I will say, by the way, that for 40 years, conservatives have been lucky to have had Rupert Murdoch in charge of, of newspapers and media because without him, it would have been completely dominated by the left. Oh, you're, and, you're right and, and about if that. You act, yeah. No, I'm not, I know you're not attacking him, old boy. Uh, look, but if you, if you want to have um, a, a media which is diverse, the only way to have it is to have one that is run by proprietors because they're plural. There are more than one of them. And it, it, if you have that, then in the long run, you're going you're gonna to have every now and then a, a media boss who does things you don't like. But if you believe in the plural ownership of the media, then I think you want to uh, you want uh, independent. Now, I have to stop at that point and say we have time, you know, with I'm beginning to think we may need to turn the alarm on to get you to leave. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, you know, it, the test worked, I thought. Uh, and and, and um, le so, so let me say that uh, we're going to take one more question, and I think we're going to direct it to our guest, uh, uh, Dave Rubin, and, and then we'll go from there. Well, now there are 100 questions, hands being raised. <laughs> that the, 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 this gentleman... Yeah. Well, I leave it to them. Thank you. So progressive people in power and billionaires use their time and energy to progress their political agenda, while conservatives don't do it as much because they're busy going on with their lives or pursue non-controversial uh, initiatives. So how could we uh, encourage conservative billionaires and people in power to use their resources uh, to advance uh, a return to normality, or should we even do that? Well, it would be nice if more of them got involved for sure, right? I think sometimes, you know, you're right. I, I think I addressed this a little bit at the, at the beginning in my talk. You know, conserve, again, this sort of wide conserve net. You're out there just kind of living your life and worried about your family and, and what you want on this planet and all of those things. It... it Politics doesn't become this religious cult-like mission to to dominate everything. You accept that there are people that are different than you. You you want to agree to disagree. Hopefully, um, we could probably use more billionaires in play. You know, Peter Thiel obviously was very big in Trump's first run. He's now announced he's not going to be involved at all in the next election. So that's one going the other direction. I don't think the answer though is ultimately that because that if we get bankrolled by enough billionaires, that ultimately that will solve all of the problems. I I really do believe if we build enough of a decentralized internet, if we figure out enough ways to have commerce outside of the system, to not have the World Economic Forum push all of their truly psychotic lunacy on us, uh, and if we start ignoring, uh, you know, a lot of what these people are pushing on us, whether it's climate or trans stuff or some of the other issues that we've mentioned here, we, that's probably the best way to do it. But yeah, a couple more billionaires probably probably wouldn't hurt either. Well, I would say, too, that we need to have fewer billionaires, conservative billionaires, throwing their money behind the Republican Party and more of them putting their money behind cultural projects, building new media, building uh, new colleges like the uh, University of Austin instead of like, who was the hedge fund guy who just gave $300 million to Harvard? Oh, to Harvard. Uh, was it Mercer? Or, yeah, yeah uh, it was one of those. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's insane. You know, we, we politics is important, but it's not going to solve everything. We need to give money to politics, but also also uh, meaningful cultural initiatives because the left owns all the culture and that's as long as the left owns the culture it's going to be much harder for us to compete if I could just say one last thing briefly I just want to say how absolutely refreshing this has been you know uh, America's become deeply unserious it's really it's really unfortunate and it's why again why I think DeSantis is kind of the right way out of this but putting politics aside uh, just to sit in a room with people uh, audience and colleagues that are trying to figure a way out of this thing. And clearly something's working here. I, that really is was the purpose of my whole mission of, of doing this trip, and we're going to do many more like this. So uh, I just want to thank you guys, because this has been an absolute pleasure. Really.
Well, you've already give, you t stolen my thunder by giving the applause before I asked for it. So th thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much, Dave.